Good morning and welcome to Rahel Baptist Church for Sunday morning, August the 13th, 2017. This morning's message brought to us by Senior Pastor Michael Franklin is entitled, The Lamb of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. I want to talk to you today about the Lamb of God before we partake of the Lord's Supper, the Lamb of God. Let me go ahead and give you the outline. The outline, number one, Jesus was a man of sorrow. If you have a bulletin and are following along with us, Jesus was a man of sorrow. Number two, Jesus was a suffering servant. Jesus was a suffering servant. And number three, Jesus was an offering for sin. He was an offering for sin. The book of Isaiah was written 700 years before the crucifixion and death of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing that there's such? And, and folks, I understand the four Gospels, and I understand uh, the written part of those four over several chapters. But I'm telling you, Isaiah 53 is the most precise precise description of Jesus Christ and what he went through. Isaiah was one of the major prophets and one of the most recognized prophets in the Old Testament. It is truly amazing how much detail God showed him hundreds of years before it actually happened. Every one of Isaiah's local prophecies came true, plus many of them had future prophecies in mind. None were any more widely known than Isaiah 53. No other Old Testament chapter gives us a more detailed description of Jesus' crucifixion and the gospel story than Isaiah 53. We will directly tie this wonderful Old Testament scripture into the Lord's Supper. And where I got my title, I was reading of the other day, and in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist said this the first time he met Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin." of the world. So we praise God for that passage. Now, in Isaiah 53, let's look at this. Jesus was a man of sorrow who had believed our report. Many of the people in that day did not believe the prophets. They did not know who he was speaking of. And Isaiah says, and the Bible tells us, even when we preach the word, not everyone will agree with us. Not everyone will believe the word of God. But I am telling you, by the word of God and the authority of God, this is God's holy word written to mankind. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And folks, the arm of the Lord is the power of God. The power of God. You think he had the power to speak the world into existence. And even Jesus' birth, some people do not believe in the virgin birth. Folks, it is imperative that we believe in the virgin birth. God has the power to place the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary. Otherwise, He could not have been the perfect Son of God. For He shall grow up before Him as a tender plant and as a root out of the dry land. He is speaking of Jesus. Notice He is capitalized there. And he was born in a manger. He wasn't born in a palace. And you think of it, the time the Jews and Israel was under Roman capture and Rome, the Roman government ran everything. But even in that, that, that spiritual time, I'm telling you, Jesus was a tender plant. Jesus was the rose of Sharon. There was no one ever like Jesus. That's why it said that, that the Bible describes him as the only begotten, one of a kind son of God. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Folks, it wasn't that he wasn't attractive. What I think the writer is trying to say was he was just a common man. Okay, a common man. And when every picture that I've seen of him, he has a beard and he has long hair. He looks like all the other men of those days. But what sets him apart was his message, not his looks. It was his message. 
He had a message uh, that was that was amazing. He had a, a message that was from God. He had a message which, again, when the scribes and Pharisees uh, were were challenging him, he would challenge them from the Word of God. And I don't think the rejection was who he was or what he looked like, but his preaching was objected to in those days. Verse 3, he was despised and rejected by men. Folks, I'm telling you, there were some folks that didn't like him at all. They didn't like his message. They didn't like what he stood for. He would call the scribes and Pharisees hypocrites. All right, He would challenge them with the Word of God. And, and I'm telling you, they tried to run him out of town. They tried to kill him before they actually did it. They, they accused him of being a liar. They called him ugly names like Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. And here's the word, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And folks, all Jesus did was try to help folks. That's all he did. He just loved on folks. He met human needs so that he could give them the spiritual uh, guidance that they did. But I'm telling you, his heart was broken over sin. So many times his disciples did the wrong thing. Judas sold him out for 30 pieces of silver. Peter denied him three times. One of the strongest spokesmen of the twelve, he denied him three times. He was a man of sorrow. And we hid as we were our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Even on the cross, if you remember for the first three hours, people mocked him. People called him a liar. People said, if you're really the Son of God, why don't you come down off that cross? People said, you said you could build the temple in three days and build it back. And, and people made fun of him. And folks, I'm telling you, all those words hurt the heart of Jesus Christ. Keep your finger there and go to John 1 with me if you would. John 1. Just one verse in John. John 1, verse 11. He came into His own, and His own did not receive Him. His family did not believe that He was the Son of God. His brothers and sisters did not believe that till later on. Many people doubted His Word and and called him a false prophet. Even his own people, the Jewish people, the Israelites, did not recognize him as the Messiah. And so he had to live with that himself. Then in Luke chapter 19, go with me to Luke 19. Luke 19, verse 41. You have to realize where we are in Luke. We're talking about here the Palm Sunday. We're talking about the triumphal entry. Jesus came in riding on a donkey and the palms, they would put them in the roads, uh, in the road and, and the crowd was huge. It was, uh, Passover week and I am just telling you, uh, it was amazing when he first came into Jerusalem and people were singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, uh, the king, the king of kings. And then as Jesus looked, look at verse 41. Notice the difference here. I I hope you've read this before. Now he drew near, he saw the city, and he wept over it. With all that pomp and circumstance, with all that uh, celebration going on, when he got to looking at the people, he broke it, it broke his heart. Why? Because he knew what was coming up. Those same people that were praising God on Monday would be asking for the Roman government to crucify him on Friday. Folks, that broke Jesus' heart. The lostness of man broke Jesus' heart. People with sin in their life, people judging one another, broke Jesus' heart. And I tell you, Jesus, according to Isaiah 53, was a man of sorrow. The second thing, he was not only a man of sorrow, but he was a suffering servant. Folks, I want to say this right off the bat. I know all of us go through hard times. I know all of us go through trying and challenging times. And I think one of the hardest times that we have in our lives is at death. Okay, it is at death. And a lot of times we don't even know what to say. Even when Lazarus died, the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. But I tell you folks, he not only wept, he suffered. Jesus suffered on the cross 
for you and I. And these next six verses are amazing verses and descriptions of how much Jesus suffered. Look at verse 4. Surely he has bore, surely he has bore our grief and carried our sorrows. Folks, Jesus knew what it was like to hurt. Jesus knew what it was like for separation. Jesus knew what it was like to not be liked. Not everybody liked Jesus or accepted His message. Yet we esteemed Him stricken. People thought, you cannot be the Son of God if you are willingly dying on a cross. You cannot. And and people didn't believe. And even the, the thief next to him said, if you are the Son of God, get us down from here. And people that went by the cross just said, you know, uh, you know, you're not a, you're not a true prophet or this wouldn't be happening to you. And there were even people thought that God was mad at Jesus and that he was punishing Jesus. And that is not true. Smitten by God and afflicted. And folks, you have to understand what the Roman crucifixion was. Folks, I am telling you, it was a horrible death. It was a slow death. It was, it was, it was torture is what it really was. And I can honestly say, after studying this again, for the, I don't know how, how many times, I truly do not believe we will ever go through what Jesus went through in our lifetime. In those 72 hours, it was an amazing thing of what went on in His life. It was brutal. It was cruel. It was painful. Verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Folks, that's our sin. He was bruised. Hold your finger there and go with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Go with me if you would. In Matthew's description of what happened. Verse 26, then he uh, released Barabbas to them. Matthew 20, uh, Matthew 27, 26. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Folks, a Roman scourging was with a cat of nine tails. It was a leather whip, and it had stones, and it had glass on the end of it. And if you saw the passion of the Christ, that is the closest thing that I've ever seen to what I believe a true Roman scourging is. He would literally whip them, and when the, that whip would go around the body of Jesus, the Roman soldiers would jerk back, and they said some description, you could literally see flesh flying off of his back. I am talking a bloody mess. I am talking about a beating. Jesus did that for you and I. And then it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the planetarium and gathered the whole garrison around him. Folks, you have to realize, Jerusalem at this time, there were thousands of people there. Those courtrooms were packed with people. And one thing that the Holy Spirit said to me more than anything else in studying this is how how they humiliated Jesus Christ in front of folks, in front of thousands, in the court of law, when He was hanging on the cross, when they were beating Him, He was humiliated in front of thousands. And they stripped Him and put a scarlet robe on Him. Folks, they were making fun of Him. They said, you want to be a king? We'll get a, we'll get a scarlet robe and we'll put on you. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, folks, if you've ever seen the crown of thorns, I am telling you, uh, the, if the, those are this big, folks. We're talking about putting it on his head and twisting it. Blood fell down his face. Blood ran down his back. They put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And if you see another uh, in the Gospels, one of the things they did, they would blindfold him. And they would make fun of him and they would punch him in the face and say, well, if you're the son of God, tell us who punched you. What's, what's, what's his first name? And they were making fun of Jesus through all of this. And here's the kicker, folks. And they spat upon Jesus. Folks, when you spit on someone, what you're saying is you are lower than dirt. You are a worm of a man. It is the total disrespect of a human being when you spit on him. 
And they took a reed and struck him on the head. And they mocked him. And they took the robe off of him. I had read one saying that he had the robe on so long that the blood had dried in his back and on the robe. And when they ripped the robe off, his back started bleeding once again. They put his own clothes on him and they led him away to be crucified. Oh, listen, folks. Those nails, they drove through his hands. Those nails, he drove, they drove through his feet. Folks, what a slow, painful, humiliating death Jesus did. Folks, I pray to God we never take the cross lightly. I pray we see what Jesus Christ himself went through for you and I. Let's look look back in Isaiah 53. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Folks, I am telling you, if you're a Christian today, you have spiritual healing. You are saved. You are bound for heaven. Jesus' death, his chastisement, his punishment gave us eternal life. Verse 6, all, notice this, I never noticed this before. This verse starts with all and it ends in all. All we like sheep have gone astray. Folks, every one of us are sinners. Every one of us have disappointed God. Every one of us have let God down. We have turned everyone to his own way. Before we got saved, we were doing it our way. We were doing it our way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Folks, I don't think Jesus suffocated to death. I don't think he bled to death. He was only on the cross six hours, folks. I believe he died of a broken heart. A broken heart. He became sin so that we might have eternal life. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Pilate twice tried to get him to talk. Tried to get him to say that he was the Son of God. But I'm telling you, Jesus said nothing. Jesus knew in this court of law that it was set up. They had false testimonies set up. They had people to lie about Jesus. And so Jesus said not a word. He was as, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her, before the shears is silent. And folks, I'm telling you, he could have called 10,000 angels. But he didn't. He didn't. He died on a cross for you and I. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Three courts of law. Three condemnations. Three death sentences. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. And for the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Oh, listen to me, folks. He died on a cross for you and I. And they made his grave with the wicked. If you remember, Pilate was trying to say, hey, we release a prisoner. And you know what they did? They released Barabbas. All right, Barabbas. Here's a man that stole. Here's a man that was a murderer. Here's a man that had done nothing wrong. But yet he was accused of being a thief. And he died between two thieves. Not just one, but two. But with the rich at his death. Remember who got his body, folks? Joseph of Arimathea. God was going to see that his son got a proper burial. God was going to see that his son got a proper tomb because he had done no violence, nor there was there any deceit in his mouth. He didn't rail at anyone. He didn't yell at anyone. He didn't say it wasn't unfair. He died on the cross for you and I. Folks, the question that I have to ask myself when I come to this is, why? Why would he do that? Why would he do that? And I've heard people say, if you were the only one that lived, he would do it for you. You know why he did it? 
He did it out of love. He loved us. Look at Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5, verse 6. Romans 5, verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, listen to me, folks. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for sinners. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, listen to me, folks. You ought to thank God that Jesus Christ stayed on that cross and died for you. He died for you, folks. And I'm telling you, you can sense the love in his heart. You can sense the love in his eyes. How many of us could be hanging on a cross and bleeding and dying and make this statement, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, if that isn't love, then the oceans are dry. Folks, that is God's love. And I wrote down a statement last night, late last night. Jesus went through hell for us so we could go to heaven with Him. Folks, I'm telling you, those last 72 hours was hell on earth. He was bleeding. He was dehydrated. He was exhausted from lack of sleep. And He went through hell for us so that we could go to heaven with Him. So we see the Lamb of God. Jesus was a man of sorrow. Jesus was a suffering servant. And finally, Jesus was an offering for sin. He was an offering for sin. Look at verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, Jesus literally became the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world the Lamb of God, who was a sin offering for all of mankind. Second Corinthians puts it like this. Second Corinthians, go with me if you would, or look on the board. Second Corinthians 5.21 For he, God, Second Corinthians 5.21, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, He had never sinned in his 33 years. He had never sinned. To be sin for us. He laid all the sin of the world. Jesus did not sin. He laid the sin on Jesus. That's why it was dark. That's why Jesus felt forsaken. He had never had that feeling in his life of sin. And he became sin for us. The Bible says that we might become the righteousness of God. His blood purchased our salvation. Folks, I'm telling you, you ought to thank God for the body of Christ. For the blood of Christ. Folks, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's a memorial service. It is a reminder about what Jesus did for us. It is a reminder that Jesus' body was broken for us. And Jesus' blood was spilled for us. And the most quoted verse in the Word of God I'll end with is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Folks, I'm telling you, when Jesus was on the cross and with His last breath said, It is finished! He was saying, I'm not dying. My body's dying. But I'm telling you, my soul will live forever. Why? Because three days later, Easter Sunday, up From the grave, He arose. And folks, because He is alive, because He is sitting at the right hand of God, because He went through that suffering for you and I, 
the blood of Jesus Christ can forgive us of all of our sins. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Folks, I am telling you, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, the greatest need you have today is to know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. All forgiveness is at the cross, my friend. Forgiveness is at the cross. And before we go into the Lord's Supper, I'm speaking to the Christians. I'm praying that your heart will be right with God. I'm asking you three questions that I've said many times and uh, I've quoted 1 John 1, nine. If you confess your sins, He is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And this is what I do before I go to bed every night. Am I right with God? Am I right with God? Am I right with my family? Am I right with my family? And am I right with my fellow man? And I pray, Christian, that you can truly say we're going to open our altars for anyone, anyone, if you just want to come pray, if you just want to come get right, if you want to just prepare your heart for the Lord's Supper. But if you don't know Jesus Christ, if you were to die today and you would stand before God, what would you tell Him? What would you tell Him? And I'm telling you, if you don't know whether you would go to heaven or not, please come down. We will be down here. We will be glad to talk to you about how to be saved. Father, thank you for the day. God, I thank you so much for your word. God, I thank you for Isaiah. God, what an amazing job he did. And God, I just, I just thank you for the cross. I just thank you, Lord, that you, you, you bled and you died for us. And God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that they would come forward and just give their heart and their life to Christ. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I know we're not perfect, but maybe today a rededication is in mind. Maybe today you're speaking to somebody about rededicating their life to Christ or coming for baptism or, or joining the church. God, this is your invitation. This is your time. So God, would you just be with us during this time? God, we love you. We thank you. Lord, we are forever in debt for what you have done to us. So God, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, and God, I know we're not worthy. None of us are worthy. But God, I thank you for forgiveness. I thank you for your unconditional love. I thank you for this memorial service, this reminder of what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come at this time?